Good morning. My name is Joel Duff, and I'm about to present some material that uh, I had been scheduled to present at a course at Veritas Theological Seminary last week. Due to some unforeseen and um, unfortunate circumstances, I was unable to present this material to the class. And when I got back, I thought uh, I had done a lot of work preparing for this material, and there were some things I wanted to say to the class and interact with them in, in it, well, share some of my observations about the class and, and how it went. And so I thought that I would uh, put this together in probably a, about a three-part series of lectures. Now, originally I had intended this material to be more interactive. I wanted to uh, ask and pose questions and actually get feedback from the class, and I was going to use it as a time of sort of active learning. I'm going to have to convert that into a lecture. I'm just sitting here in my office right now staring at a screen, not exactly the the style of lecture that I prefer. It's uh, kind of awkward, but you know, we'll see where it goes from here. So this first part of a talk that I'm going to call God's Creation, Rocks, Fossils, and Time is really focused on just having us think about how science actually works and how reliable it can be. What can we learn about the past? Um, is there a distinction between um, what some creationists call origin science and operation science. Uh, we'll, we'll delve into that particular topic. But eventually we're building up, we're going to build up a story to look at how we know what we know, um, how reliable that is, and then we'll start looking at the fossil record and eventually turn to some more uh, theological concerns in part three. So let me start by introducing myself. Um, again, I said my name's Joel Duff and I am a professor of biology, but that only tells you a very small portion, um, it only tells you a, a small bit about myself. I grew up in or my younger years in western Colorado and right now you're looking at a picture of my backyard. Um, right behind me is a neighborhood that comes to the edge of town in Grand Junction, the south side of Grand Junction. And I could ride my bike to the end of the street just a few houses down enter into this scene, and this is practically the same as it was some 30 years ago when I lived there. Um, and I would ride my bike out here, and this was my playground. And any encounter you have with rocks and soil and the parts of this world is really an encounter with the past. And this course has been um, something about, uh, it's not all been about the past, but it's been about how do we understand the past, how do we read the past, how do we interpret the past. Um, is the earth very, very old or ancient, or is it maybe very, very young, in which case, how do we actually interpret what we're seeing in front of us? I could wander around this area, um, and I picked up a number of things. Uh, in this rock, very abundantly found are a number of different fossils, especially the one on the left over there. Uh, but at crinoids, um, we have shark's teeth, uh, ammonites. All these are found prevalently in this particular area. So as you, as you walk around and you pick up these fossils, of course, you're, you're encountering is like, where did these come from? These are things that actually had lived here at one time in the past, and they represent very much of a community of organisms. And if you know the types of organisms I'm showing you, you would recognize these as being sort of shallow ocean creatures. And of course, I'm a long way from the ocean here in western Colorado, but nonetheless, that's what, that's what the fossils are speaking to me. And in part two, we'll be looking at communities of fossils and, and what we can learn from the fossil record. Um, but this is sort of my introduction to this topic of science and faith. Um, my father is a pastor, and the church that he was a pastor of is only probably several hundred meters um, directly behind me in this picture, in this neighborhood that we lived in. Uh, and so really we were on the edge of thinking about, uh, we were faced with thinking about creation all the time because you could see the fossils, people in the church could see the fossils. Um, these kind of questions about the age of the earth were not unknown questions. And when you live in this kind of environment where you see um, Really, you see God's world sculpted out in front of you in this amazing geology. Um, you're really forced to think about, well, where did all this come from? How did this, how did this happen? You have questions about the flood, 
Um, could that have caused all the features that we're seeing? Where did these fossils come from? Um, how did they come to be? Why are they in a collection like this where we only see oceanic fossils? Why don't I find dinosaur bones not far from this site? Um, 15, 20 miles away, there's some face, famous uh, dinosaur uh, fossils, and yet dinosaur fossils are unknown from this particular set of rock, much to my uh, disappointment as a child uh, searching for fossils. All right, so let's turn to a couple really basic questions. And I'm going to start with a very simple question that has a very simple purpose. And um, you're going to think that this example might be a little bit silly, but I, I hope you see the point that I'm, I'm going to try to make here. And I was going to ask the class, and I, and I do this with some of my classes here at the university. I start out my class by saying, did T-Rex have short arms? I've all seen pictures of T-Rexes. I'm showing you one right here where there's got these little tiny short arms. And uh, you can raise a number of questions about those arms, like what in the world did they use those for? You know, so what was the function or the purpose of those arms? But I want to ask an even more fundamental question, and that is, did they have short arms? Sure, we see lots of pictures of T-Rexes with short arms, but I want to know, how do we know that they had short arms? Another way of, of putting this, I guess, would be, have you seen a T-Rex personally? Right? Do you have personal eyewitness evidence of a T-Rex having short arms? Probably not. Do you know of anyone else who's seen a T-Rex with short arms? Probably not. Do you think that anyone, do we have any recorded history, all right, ancient records of individuals personally witnessing T-Rexes and seeing that they have short arms? No, we don't. So this is a question of, were you there? All right, were you there when that dinosaur roamed the Earth, whether that was 4,000 years ago or 65 million years ago? Um, you weren't there. You weren't there to see it, so how do we know that it had short arms? Now, the second picture, the inset picture down here, is also of a T-Rex, and I want to point out where that picture comes from. That picture comes from the Creation Museum in Kentucky, all right, Answers in Genesis Creation Museum, and that T-Rex right there has little short arms, all right? So the, the, the people who are responsible for constructing that particular model of a T-Rex and place it in their museum, all right, certainly believe that T-Rex has short arms and they're displaying that to millions of visitors, showing them that T-Rex has short arms, all right? They are proclaiming that T-Rex has short arms. I don't believe there's a sign there which says, we're not really sure that this T-Rex had short arms or not, so this is a wild speculation. No, I think they're fairly confident that T-Rex looked something like what they had there. You know, we're not sure about the, I'm not sure about the, the, the coloration of the, uh, the skin. I don't think we have any evidence for that. Ah, I just gave something away, didn't I? I just said we don't have any evidence for it, which suggests that maybe we do have evidence that T-Rexes have short arms. Now, I would push my class to tell me what that evidence is, and surely somebody would say, well, don't we have skeletons? Right? Don't we have like the bones of those short arms? And so we can reconstruct what a T-Rex looks like from its bones. And yes, that's how we reconstruct most dinosaurs is from their bones. But I still have to ask you, how do we really know? Now this is where I'm going to get, I'm going to get a little bit silly here, but I want you to really think about what it means that we know something from the past. Dinosaurs existed in the past. We're recreating the past now. All right, we're doing origin science. We're doing historical science right now as we're talking about this. And Answers in Genesis has a picture of a T-Rex with a, a model of T-Rex with short arms. So they have done historical science and they accept, they accept the findings of historical science. And I know they do because they have a model that includes a, you know, what T-Rex may have looked like. And that's all historical science not based on any experimental evidence in their, in their way of understanding uh, experimental operation science. This is not operation science, it's historical science. But let's link a little bit further about those dinosaur bones. I wish I had a picture here of the actual bones. Are those bones, if they were found in the ground, you're digging around the rock and all of a sudden you find these bones and you find individual finger bones and different parts of the wrist and then maybe a, a portion of the arm bone, 
Are those bones actually attached to each other in the fossil record? No, they're not. Right? You have cartilage that has decayed usually around the bone joints. Those bones are not attached together. In other words, when you find the bones in the fossil record, you'll find a bone, and there's a bone right next to it, potentially, sitting right next to it, but not actually attached to it. So and again, this is my silly little point, but I think it's a point that all of you will accept. All right? You'll say, well, if I see bones in the shape of several bones sticking out that look like fingers, and they're all laying next to each other, I'm going to assume, or I'm going to infer, right, that those bones at one time were attached. In other words, when that organism was living, which is another assumption that, that those bones actually represent something that was actually alive before. All right, so that's something that is a foundational assumption that even creationists accept, is that those bones, even though no one's ever seen that organism alive, they accept that it was alive based on historical evidence and historical inference. But those bones were not attached, but we infer that they probably were. Because we can see in the present day, all right, the present telling us about the past, we can see in the present day that those bones, if we were to lay out an animal and it were to decay, and then the, all you had was the bones left and the bones were sitting next to each other, we can see that, oh yeah, those bones were actually, I could watch the entire process, and I can say, oh yes, those bones are no longer attached, but they were at one point, that represents an arm. All right, so it's not a big stretch to say that, okay, so we've got fossilized bones of arms, and we can see that those arms are attached to, or were attached, we're inferring they were attached to a shoulder blade, and that's where animals have their arms, and it looks like a little short, stubby arm. All right, so that's where we get this idea that they have short, stubby arms. But let me add in one other detail here. All right, if, if the Creation Museum wants to be truly accurate about their models, they really need to take one of the arms off the T-Rex because there isn't any direct evidence that T-Rex has two arms. All right, direct or at least, um, I guess direct, maybe not, maybe not the right word, but let's put it this way. Sue, the, the most complete T-Rex ever found, is missing one of her arms, right? So some scavenger or something, we can infer maybe that some scavenger pulled it off, dragged it somewhere else, and we've never found it. All right, so 85% of her bones, but she is missing one arm. She only has one arm. So why do we draw T-Rexes with two arms, right? Has there ever been a, a T-Rex found with every single one of its arm bones? No, there hasn't, at least not that I can find any record of. There is no T-Rex fossil for which we have every single one of the arm bones or both arms, and yet, every single picture you've ever seen of a T-Rex has them having two arms. Now, are scientists lying? Are we faking you out? Are we um, playing loose and fast with the data? All right, are we? No, I don't think so. I think you have every reason to be confident that this isn't fakery. Sure, the actual literal data does not exist but we have plenty of inferential data. We have lots of, of, of oh, I guess you could say, um, um, circumstantial data that clearly points to T. Rex as having two arms. Now, what do I, what do I mean? What are, what are some of those evidences? Well, for one thing, we found many T. Rexes. Some of them have parts of one arm, the left arm. Some have parts of a right arm. None of them really have all the parts of both arms. But when you put the picture together of a population, again with an assumption that these are all the same species, pretty good assumption. Put that all together and what you'll find is that, oh yeah, well sure, you have one has one arm, one has another arm. We see all the pieces combined means that, yes, there is a T-Rex that has two arms if you put all the pieces together. We just don't have a single T-Rex that has both arms. But let me show you additional evidence for that. Oh, I forgot, I'm going to go back uh, just a little bit. Uh, I was gonna. I was gonna point to to this picture. This comes out of uh, Dinosaurs in Eden by Ken Ham. And the illustrations in that book show dinosaurs and their possible um, ecology in the garden before Adam sins, and showing that they have teeth still and they have claws on their hands, um, eating these plants. Now we'll come back to that idea of you know what was life like in the garden and the the, the important 
implications of this later, but I just want to point out right now that um, what they're showing are dinosaurs with claws, with two little short arms. These are also theropods, they're not T-Rexes. And most of the features they're showing here, we know only from little pieces of the dinosaurs, not the whole thing. We've recreated from pieces. All right, but Answers in Genesis is confident enough or willing to accept this historical science and present it in a book as if this is the way they actually looked, or at least very similar to the way they looked. Um, usually with an acknowledgement, we don't know the skin color, but we know the general shape because that's based on some of the bones. Now, here is, I think, the compelling evidence that T. rexes have two arms and not just one arm and that they're short. Here's a whole variety of different theropods. Theropods are dinosaurs that, that walked on two legs, so didn't use their front legs for walking. And we have many different species of theropods with a variety of different morphologies or shapes, um, all with this basic pattern of walking on two legs. And what we find is that for most of them, maybe none of them, we have both arms, but we have all of them have little short arms to some extent. Right? Whatever bones we have suggests that they had short arms. Now, T. rexes also have evidence that they have short arms. So the fact that we don't have one fossil that has every single bone doesn't mean that we really have any rational reason to doubt that they had two short arms. Okay? That's that's my really that's the central point here. Beyond reasonable doubt. Right? Are any of you sitting sitting here still uh thinking, hmm, you know what? You haven't really proven that they have short arms, right? Because I can't actually show you a single T-Rex that had those two short arms. There are alternative hypotheses. It could be that one T-Rex had one arm, a left arm, another T-Rex had a right arm, and another T-Rex had a partial right arm and a full left arm, but not a full right arm. And it could be there never was a T-Rex with two complete arms, all right? But that would require, all right, some very interesting, um, well, very difficult, it's, it's not reasonable, I'll just put it that way, right? It's possible, but it's not reasonable. In a court of law, you have 12 jurors, and they look at the data I've just shown you, plus other data I could show you, and they're going to say, it's beyond reasonable doubt that a T-Rex had two short arms. We don't have to actually have seen it. I don't have to have a photograph and I don't have to have a person who stood next to a T-Rex, looked at it, and went, it has two arms, and I'm writing that down for all history to know, yes, it has two arms. We can, with great assurance, determine facts like this about the nature of historical things. Now, that's a really silly, simple example. You're going to think, well, okay, whoop-de-doo, that doesn't really change anything. We're not talking about the age of the Earth necessarily, although I actually think we are. Um, we're not, uh, this isn't uh, earth-shattering, but I guess my point will be, as I show you some other examples, is that in fact Answers in Genesis accepts hundreds of thousands of conclusions of historical science with little complaint and in order to even build their particular um, model, they accept many aspects of historical science, while at the same time they talk about how it's origin science and you can't trust origin science. Right? There's a lot of irony involved in a lot of their argumentation. So let's look at a quote here. Let's, 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 let's just get out the, the, the big question here that I'm, that I'm trying to address. This is a, a quote from Do Creationists Reject Science by Peter Galling uh, in 2008 on the AAG website. And both creation and evolution, here's the quote here, both creation and evolution make claims about an unrepeatable past that was not observed by humans. Thus, both creation and evolution fall under the category of historical science. That is distinctly different from operational or observational science, which is a method methodological system governing direct directly observed repeatable experiments such as laboratory experiments. Take a look at the difference between operational science and its counterpart historical or origin science, which requires extrapolation beyond the presently available, in other words, faith in a story about the unobserved past. In other words, you have to have faith to believe that those T-Rexes had two arms. You have to have faith. 
you don't really have any other way because it's all origin science and you cannot trust it. It has assumptions. I told you about some of the assumptions. I told you how to assume that those bones were connected at one point in time. You did not see them connected. You have to assume they were connected. That's an assumption. But I guess just because there's assumptions doesn't mean there isn't still a lot of confidence in our conclusions. So you know, they're saying operation science based on the census, assuming they're reliable. Okay, so even questioning the census at times. Um, assumptions about the past and origin science. We use experiments in operational science. Now I'm going to show you that a lot of science done today doesn't actually use experiments. Right? So they've even limited science to a very, very, very small window that, that, that throws out much of what even you and I probably consider science today. Um, origin science is just about extrapolation. Yes, I extrapolated those bones to suggest that T. rexes have two arms that are both short. Deals with the present, deals with the past. Results in repeatable conclusions and technology, all right, versus origin science, which results in unrepeatable stories about the past. We're just making that up. I just made that up about those, those T. rex arms, right? I just created this mythology and this story about how you could put this little bits of data, which everyone accepts there's data, and then there's the fossils there. But in order to put those bones together, I had to use assumptions. I had to use inference. I had to extrapolate, right? I did all those things for you. And I created an unrepeatable story. I can't go back and take a T-Rex and kill it and watch it decay and show that that's the way the bones would actually look or take a picture of a T-Rex, right? So you cannot trust what the story I've just given you. So let's look at some other stories that you basically can't trust. And I'll show you how I think that we can make some very firm conclusions from some of these pieces of evidence. Now I'm going to show you where there are times where what we can't know. There are things we can know, there are things we can't know. Uh, but to throw out everything as if every piece of data was suspect is, is, is um, unreasonable. And as I pointed out before, creation scientists don't throw it all out either. They accept hundreds of thousands of conclusions of historical science. It's just that when, it's, when they don't like the conclusion, even the very reasonable conclusions of historical science, all of a sudden, oh, that's not valid because it's historical science. Can't cherry pick where you're going to pick and choose which reliable results you're going to accept or not. So let's, let's look at a couple examples. The fossil record of elephant behavior. Elephant behavior? Does the fossil record actually tell us something about behavior? Well, very often it doesn't. I can't really determine how a bird might have, uh, what their bird call might have been like, or whether you know, how they flap their wings in order to attract a mate, um, we think of as behavior. But there are certain kinds of behavior which we can see in the fossil record. Now, I'm going to look at footprints. So footprints are not the actual remains of the organism itself, right? It's not one of their bones, it's not their teeth, right? It's not a part of the organism, but it is a part of the evidence of that an animal had been at a particular place in time, right? They had walked across this particular location. So what you're seeing in this picture is elephant footprints, right? Now, why are they elephant footprints? That, that takes a little bit of explanation, but just look at these footprints. There's a close-up there. I don't know, if you were walking across this uh, desert rock, would you necessarily look down and go, oh, those are footprints, or that was some animal that came by here? No, you probably might not recognize it, but an expert who has looked at a lot of fossil footprints would very quickly pick up on the fact that there's something going on here. Now, I want to point out that there's this, this, is, there's this flat rock. There are thousands and thousands of fossil footprints in the United Arab Emirates and all over Saudi Arabia in the rocks there. And some of them are of elephants. Now, looking at it here, you might say, well, okay, I see some little depressions. Right, but maybe those are just some other feature of the rock caused by some inorganic process, you know, not caused by a living thing. Well, let me show you the aerial uh, photograph. So what you have here is this is an aerial photograph of this block of rock. And what you'll see over here is you see these footprints? There's 12 individual lines of tracks. So when you see hundreds of footprints and you see them two by two in step-type fashion, 
uh, going on for a straight line for a long period of time, you know that that's not a natural phenomena. And it's not something that the rock just produced, all right, by rain and erosion or something like that. All right? Again, assumptions. Was I there? I mean, were you there? I wasn't there. No one saw these elephants actually walk across this particular location. This is clearly historical science. We're talking origin science. How did these, what are, what is the origin of this particular uh, mark in this rock? This is origin science. But it's not unreasonable to think these are animal tracks. I can see a series of them going along, and it's thought that these were 12 elephants that walked as a group. Why as a group? Because you can actually trace the individuals across this whole thing. You can see where some of them maybe walked a little bit over um, the line of another one. All right, so they didn't walk 12 side by side, they walked as a group. This is where we get the idea of we're looking at behavior. We're looking at 12 that happen at the same time. The erosion of the footprints is about the same for all the footprints meaning that they were all created about the same time because they hardened about the same way and they were fossilized the same way. How they would have this would have been some kind of mud flat after a storm or something like that. It's muddy, they've walked across there, the whole area dries out, hard, the mud hardens, and then maybe there was a flood that came in, so maybe there was a, uh, maybe this is a marsh, and then all of a sudden a flood comes in, the water gets raised up, fine particulates, sediments fall into these depressions right? and they end up creating a different layer of rock and now as that layer of rock has eroded off it's leaving these depressions left. There is one other track and you see the track goes from the top left down toward the bottom right and that's a solitary elephant and that elephant walks over the tracks of the other 12 at a later period in time. Their tracks are a little bit fresher which tells us that that elephant didn't pass over right at the same moment or right behind the other elephants, but probably you know, either hours or possibly even days um, later, maybe hours later. All right, so we see a little bit about, this tells us that elephants weren't all solitary in the past, but they traveled in packs. They traveled as groups, as family groups. In fact, one of the sets of tracks is a little bit smaller, suggesting there was a juvenile with them. How large were these elephants? You can tell from the distance of their steps, doesn't look like they were running. So we can look at today's elephants, we can see how they walk, we can watch how they run, we can look at their footprints and the kinds of things that they, the, the way it looks when they step. We can look at these tracks and we can say, ah, I can see that the distance between these steps is a little bit further than today's elephants because it's probably an even larger elephant than any elephant alive today. We know that at the time, radiometrically dated, that there are fossils of elephants in this area as well that belong to a four-tusked elephant. We'll look at elephants a little bit later. I got a whole thing on the different kinds of elephants. Let's continue on with uh, some other dino some other trackways. But this time I want to look at dinosaurs. We've got to got to get some dinosaurs, more dinosaurs into this talk. You can never have too many dinosaurs, right? Um, there are millions and millions of fossil footprints of dinosaurs in the fossil record all around the world. Um, many of them are just solitary footprints, but we have many places where there are trackways. And those trackways exist in multiple layers of rock, all in the rock that's dated to the, the Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous ages. But I particularly like this particular set of rocks. It's very, very impressive. Um, this is the Cal Orco Quarry in Bolivia. And what you have here is a limestone slab about 0.9 miles long and over 300 feet high at a 72 degree incline and if you're looking carefully there you'll be able to see that there is what appears to be tracks on this rock All right? and those are hardened rock tracks and sure enough that's what those are those are what we think are dinosaur tracks and uh, that track right there on the left would be some kind of brontosaurus type thing walking on four legs. So those are very similar to the elephant tracks, but what I didn't point out in the other ones is the elephant tracks, you can actually see in some of them the toenails. Uh, dinosaurs didn't have toenails. Um, at least there's no evidence that they had them from any dinosaurs, so I think we infer that they didn't. Um, T. rexes, uh, sorry, yeah, I just misspoke. T-Rexes have toenails and they have claws. Brontosaurus have have, probably had a version of that, but they were in a different uh, 
they, they looked different uh, than they did in, in elephants. So anyway, we can see from these particular tracks the way that the pad is is a little bit different than an elephant. And this is probably some kind of brontosaurus or plant-eating uh, animal that walked on all fours. But there's also theropod tracks on this particular set too. In fact, all together there's eight different kinds of dinosaurs that have tracks all on this uh, slab of rock. I show this picture to the right just to show you the scale of this. This is amazing how large it is, um, this particular fossil trackway. This is in a quarry and so what they're doing is that they've been uh, slicing off rock, this, these layers of sandstone. Uh, layers of limestone. Um, all together there's 462 so far found and they're finding new ones all the time because these tracks are going to be gone someday. Some of these that I'm showing you might already be gone. They're going to cut down this wall, this layer of rock, right? And there's going to be another layer of rock underneath and we already know that some of those layers also have dinosaur tracks in them. So they're going to find more and more and more. In fact, they've already found dinosaur tracks in eight separate layers of rock. So there's eight different species of dinosaurs represented, at least maybe even including T. rex or some kind of very large theropod like T. rex. Now, let's go back here just real quick and look at these, uh, look at this rock. I want you to think for just a minute about the origins of these footprints. Right. Is it unreasonable to think that these footprints came from an animal walking across a surface in the past? No. Were you there to see it? No. Is there any other kind of eyewitness testimony? No. Is it in the Bible that it talks about dinosaurs walking across this mudflat? No. All we have is looking from the past, looking at present processes, looking at animals, how footprints work, uh, using our scientific method of, of, of exploration, examination, of observation, right, and inferring what must have happened here. So there's all these dinosaur footprints, but they're at a 72 degree angle. Do you think that any dinosaur could have climbed up this wall at 72, at 72 degrees and made these footprints? No, so it's not unreasonable to think that when the footprints were made, these layers of sediment, they didn't make them on rock, they made them on sediment. These layers of sediment were not at 72 degrees, but were probably close to horizontal. Right? So we're, we're, again, we're, we're making some assumptions here, but I think they're very reasonable assumptions. Right? And every single time you come to that conclusion, I would conclude that this, this material that you're seeing here was at horizontal at one time in the past. All right, I've made a historical conclusion. I've used historical sciences and, and I have said something about the past. I've drawn a conclusion about the past. And again, I think everybody agrees. I think even uh, Andrew Snelling and various creationists who would have studied this would agree that these fossil footprints were made while these, this land was horizontal. But that means that there was a layer of sediment, animals walked across, Sediments had that those footprints had to have been uh, preserved probably because the material dried and hardened enough that when the next layer of sediment was put on, they didn't get completely obliterated. The next layer of sediment was put on, and there was a population of, of animals around that, that then again walked across that particular surface, and then another layer of sediment put on top of that. And there's been at least eight different layers um, of this material that have been laid down with footprints on top of them. After all of that happened, you then had to have this entire region uplifted to 72 degrees. And also, none of this rock layer is bent, which suggests that all this rock layer was, all right, we've, we've already heard Andrew Snelling uh, basically insist that bent rock must have been bent when it was soft, right? The, uh, the, the corollary to that is when you see long, long stretches of very, very straight rock that are tipped up to violent degree angles, right? The assumption there then is that that rock must have been solid when it got tipped because if it was soft and pliable, it would have bent instead of tipping up. So this rock would have had to have hardened completely before it actually got tipped up. And then after it got tipped up, you then had erosion of the, the mountain on top. Now, the, the young earth model or the flood model 
um, suggests that all these layers were put down in the flood. Dinosaurs were running around trying to escape the flood. You had these tsunami waves coming up and pushing over new sediment. And then the dinosaurs would run across again and put some new footprints down. But all that had to turn to rock, and then it all had to be tipped up. And then these mountains right, had to be sculpted right, presumably by the flood water as well. But that would mean they would all have to be tipped up. They would have already turned to solid rock during the flood itself so that it, they could get eroded by the later flood waters. I'm not sure that any of the models suggest that the rock formed that fast within basically days um, of, of, this, of this sediment having been laid over the top of it. So this represents a very challenging uh, particular site uh, for creationists. I think all fossil footprints that actually occur in the middle of what was supposed to be a global flood are a severe challenge to uh, flood geology. Um, but these that are tipped up to such a violent degree, and they show different sized animals. There's no sorting here. Right? They talk about hydrological sorting in the fossil record. There's no sorting here. There's very small footprints and there's very large footprints. There's footprints of adults along with juveniles. How come? 15,000 feet of sediment were laid down below them in some violent catastrophic event and yet somehow dinosaurs survived in almost like family groups, small and large dinosaurs, and then managed to walk across this particular surface. The alternative scenario is that there was a time in the past in which there were groups of dinosaurs living along a marshy or a, a, a coastline area um, making these fossil footprint, making these footprints, and that they got preserved, but not in a catastrophic um, way. So, what uh, one thing you can refer to this as uh, these types of evidences I'm showing is we call those the smoking gun evidences. That's the type of thing we're looking for in historical science. What is the what is that smoking gun? Where is the smoke coming out of the gun that suggests that that gun went off? In other words, I didn't see the gun go off, right? I don't have a witness. I don't have a witness that actually saw the gun. I didn't see someone shoot someone. But what I do have is I have the smoke that came from that gun. Right? I've got the bullet that came from that gun. I have the shattered glass that came from that gun. I have the glass from two different windows that allows me to figure out a trajectory to show me where the gun was held when it was shot. Right? All those things are pieces of evidence that then point us back to and allow us to infer what happened, right? to rediscover a past event. Um, so we look at something like the Hawaiian Islands, which you looked at earlier um, in this class, and we see that we can see a, tra a trajectory of large islands that are somewhat worn down, but it have uh, what look to be very large volcanoes that were active in the recent past. And as you go farther away from the active volcano, you get more and more and more worn down islands. Now there's an alternative scenario is that they were just created to look, you know, just as they are. All right, that's appearance of age that they were just created that way. Um, on Andrew Snelling's view, all the different islands were formed within a period of just a few weeks or maybe a month or two in the, in the at the end of the tail end of the flood period when the when the plates were catastrophically running away and going very very quickly. In which case, all these all these uh, all these um, volcanoes were built very, very quickly. Uh, but if that were the case, I would expect all the different islands to look kind of similar because they've had about the same amount of time to erode. The eyeball test to me is just common sense. You look at these islands, you say, wow, one of them looks fairly young. The other ones look like they're more worn down. And this last one down here looks like it's completely worn down gotten and, and worn off. That should take a different amount of time. They are not the same age. Now you can use radiometric dating to try to find the specific ages, but I don't need to have the specific ages to know that there's a difference in the ages of these. And I want to illustrate that a little bit further by taking that data one step further. It's one thing to talk about the progression of the of the islands one to another and um, from young to oldest island, but I want to look at one particular island and show that there's a progression of age from the top of the island, from the top layers of the rock, down through the rock layers. So in the, the Hawaiian uh, scientific drilling project was a project which uh, drilled down uh, several thousand meters into the main island of Hawaii at Hilo Bay. Here's the drilling uh, apparatus and, they, and here's where they drilled down into the rock. 
And I just want to show you this, this diagram, which is my cartoon of the, of the results. What they did was they drilled down here, uh, and I'm just showing you the, the uh, 670 meters of core plus 280, so about 1,000 meters, about 3,000 feet. And what they found was in the top 280 meters, there were 43 distinct layers of lava, all right, lava flows. All right, so you have pancakes of, of lava flows in this core that they've taken. And so you're looking at a lava flow, and then on top of that must be a lava flow that came later, and then after that there's another lava flow that occurred that, that's set upon top of that. It's hard to imagine a scenario in which all this was created at exactly the same time. No, this had to have been a series of lava flows. So at a minimum, if this island is only 4,000 years old, and all of this occurred within just a month or two, you would have to have lava flows continuously adding on top of each other. But if that were occurring, if the entire island would have formed, there must have been multiple volcanoes going off at the same time. In other words, all the volcanoes you see on the island must have all been active at one time and flowing away. But what these cores tell us is that's not the case. Each island has many different volcanoes on it, but only one or two might have been active at one particular time. In this case, what you have is Mauna Kea, which we think is an older volcano. And the bottom 150 distinct lava flows from Mauna Kea in the 670 meters is all down here in the bottom. All right, it's as if that was the volcano that was providing all the lava. And you can see that from the chemical, again, historical science, the chemistry of the rock itself is like that that comes from Mauna Kea. So we infer that those lava flows came from Mauna Kea. Not an unreasonable assumption. Can I absolutely prove that? No, but I can be on reasonable doubt. Suggest, not more than suggest. I can be on reasonable doubt know that those lava layers came from Mon that Mauna Kea uh, volcano. And then on top of that, there's a point at which there's a, there's a contact layer where there's actually a weathered surface. So it appears that that volcano finally subsided and there was a, a layer of soil form, probably a forest there. And eventually Mauna Loa started to flow and it added layers, 43 different distinct layers. And intermixed in those are actually several coral reefs and there's actually ash layers in there as well. But the coral reef at 34 meters below sea level um, represents a time in which where it is now land was probably actually below the sea level. Um, and there was a, a, a coral reef growing there. And eventually lava flowed out over on top of the coral reef and protect and um, preserved it. Now, a coral reef in itself takes quite a bit of time to grow. This didn't occur in a few months. Coral reef might have been tens to hundreds of years to produce. And then you had the layers of lava on top. The simple point here is not to tell you that this is exactly um, you know, 1.5 million years of, of history, but to tell you that this represents discrete moments in time, discrete events. Each event, a lava flow, is semi-catastrophic, right? It's, it's something where that entire lava flow might have occurred in one day. You had 15, 20 centimeters, or maybe two or three feet of lava, or maybe 10 or 15 feet of lava actually got put there. All right, so it's not millions of years for that for that density, but it might have been thousands of years later or hundreds of years later before the next lava flow occurred. But that lava flow occurred in a short period of time and laid down a whole thick layer of sediment uh, or, or lava, which is preserved. So you have a whole bunch of discrete segments of time that have occurred and they're separated by time. Now I can't tell you how long it was between the two different lava flows. Well, with radiometric dating, we could actually tell you something about um, those lava flows. Let's move to, let's do two other examples and then we'll, we'll finish up here with part one. The world's largest rock tumbler. I was fascinated, really captivated by a story that I read a couple years ago about uh, these crazy rocks in the Atacama Desert in South America. And it got me thinking. And the basic question I asked when I saw this picture was, how long have these rocks been lying here? All right, so these are rocks sitting in this incredibly barren desert. This, in fact, just last week, this was named the driest place on earth. Goes decades without having any rain. You can see there's just no plant life here. Um, it's like almost like a moonscape or something, except for the person standing there. 
But there are these rocks sitting out there, and I wonder just like how long have they been sitting there? All right, so again, we have our, our worldview thing we're looking at here. Is this, have they just been sitting there for a couple thousand years, or could they have been sitting there longer? Is there any way of knowing? And this again is another one of those, you know, it's great to talk about radiometric dating and all these sophisticated methods for determining the age of the Earth. I just go with the eyeball test, the basic, uh, simple scenarios, the things that are just like common sense that make you say, huh, yeah, that would take a long time. Or, oh, no, I can see where that might not take a long time. Based on our common everyday experience um, today. So here's the particular rock that I was interested in. You notice this funny rock. It's got what looks like kind of this girdle around it. It clearly looks like it's worn. right? Doesn't that look like something has been wearing around? It's almost like somebody tipped it up and had been rolling it around for a long time. And so we're just going to ask the question, how did that rock get to look that way? And you see there's a rock behind it as well. It's also worn around the sides. How in the world did that rock get that way? So what are some hypotheses? So if we were in class, we would have, I would have actually taken hypotheses for this. And you could have thought about giving me some hypotheses. Then we'd figure out, how could we test those hypotheses? Was I there to see this rock actually form this way, to become the way it is? No. Do I know anyone else that's seen it that way? No, although there's going to be one exception in just a minute. Um, but we can test different ideas. So here's a hypothesis. You know, um, you know, it rain, maybe it rains there a lot, and this is uh, the water has worn off the side. Yeah, you know, I think you probably was like, eh, I don't think that sounds very reasonable because then this top would kind of maybe look the same. Maybe it was tipped up. Maybe, uh, maybe it rolled down the mountain. And as it rolled down the mountain, it actually eroded around the side like this, um, and then fell over and came to lay right here. Maybe that's true for all the other rocks as well. Uh, there's lots of different hypotheses we could come up with. Main one you might come up with though is wind erosion, right? Maybe the wind picks up sand particles, and the sand particles then sort of erode and hit. All right, they're abrasive, and so they're hitting the side of this rock, and they're kind of wearing the rocks around the sides. But there are other rocks in the Atacama Desert, not right at that exact location, but there are many others in other lo other places. Again, another uh, very forbidden-looking desert. In this case, this rock has been eroded by the wind. The wind carries sand at a low level, scouring the bottom of the rock. And as it scours the bottom of the rock, it becomes smaller. It creates these weird looking pillars um, because the top of the rock isn't being eroded as quickly. This rock, if you just do basic physics and chemistry, and well, really physics, like how big are the sand particles? How fast could they be moving? What's the impact rate? What's the hardness of the rock? And you just calculate out how long it would take to erode that particular rock. You're looking at probably this rock has probably been standing here for a couple hundred thousand years in order to get to this point. All right, how are you going to speed that up? In the creationist um, model, this rock can't be more than 4,200 years. This whole desert had to form after the flood. All right, so all the sand uh, had, to, had to fill in this area. These rocks had to, you know, these rocks are probably part of a larger rock complex that's below it, but then they, all this sand had to fill up this area, and then this had to start begin to erode. Right? It can't be more than, say, 4,000 years old. But we also know that there's uh, etchings on some of these rocks from the hundreds and hundreds of years ago, if not possibly thousands of years ago. And so that tells us that it hasn't eroded very much in the last couple thousand years. So what processes caused that? It wasn't water. Probably it was wind. But if it was wind, we'd have to suggest that past rates of wind and abrasion were drastically higher than they are today. And even so, it's not even, I don't even think, physically possible within 4,000 years without um, completely unreasonable physical scenarios that we'd have to draw up. So back to our rocks here. Now I'm showing you a different angle of these rocks. So here you see, like lots of these rocks here have this funny little girdle around them, but it doesn't look like wind erosion because the wind erosion would be eroding the base of them at a greater rate there would also be uh, erosion of the soil around it, to, uh, around there. So there's not really a lot of wind at this location. And it doesn't appear in the past there was a lot of wind in this location. So we still are left with, like, how in the world do they have these strange little uh, eroded girdles around these rocks? Now, where do the rocks come from? They came from the top of this mountain, which is volcanic. So again, in the young earth creationist 
viewpoint, this is a volcano that sits on top of many layers of sediment. So the layers of sediment came from a global flood, and then near the end of the flood you had a volcano form. That volcano had to cool the rock crystallized. That crystallized rock then had to start to erode right, and break off, and as pieces break off, they make their way down the side of this hill and eventually work their way out into this desert plain. Of course, that desert plain had to be developed before the rocks could be able to migrate out onto it. All right, so we're, we're looking at hundreds and hundreds of years after the flood at best, in which case this is all less than 4,000 years, this particular scene. So what we have, what happened was, and what was the, the neat part of the story is that it was kind of like a, a mystery. How did this happen? How did these rocks get eroded this way? Well, there was, an, there was a person who was investigating this site, not necessarily because of the rocks, but for other things about life here and you know, the soil moisture and so forth, and he was standing on these rocks, and he actually was pondering the question of like how these rocks get this way, and there was an earthquake, right? And there was a, I think it was like a 5.7 or a 6.5 earthquake, I can't remember which, and what he heard was, all of a sudden he realized that all these rocks were jiggling, right? And he heard them bonking into each other. So he heard this little tap, 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 tap. These rocks, the rocks that are next to each other were actually vibrating and knocking into each other. And all of a sudden it was like, this is the serendipity of science sometimes. Sometimes we don't come up with hypotheses. Sometimes it's just an accident, you know, or we're just in the right place at the right time. And all of a sudden it's like, wow, I hadn't thought about that. Earthquake. Earthquake causes them to jiggle, bump into each other, and gradually erodes the sides of the rocks. Now, not all of them are bumping into each other. In fact, the vast majority aren't. In one, partic in one earthquake, these are very, very heavy rocks. Just a few of them are bumping into each other, and a few of them might move over an inch or two or a centimeter here and there. Some of these are separated from each other by 20, 30, 40 meters from each other and aren't next to any of the rocks. So they, over time, have had to jiggle all the way over and touch another one and jiggle over and touch another one. You can calculate, all right, how much jiggling would you need to do? How many earthquakes would you need to have? Now, if the earthquakes were 9, 10, you know, massive earthquakes, right, this would maybe make the rocks jumble around a lot more, but it also would create other problems. So it doesn't appear that they've had massive earthquakes here. But we know that this is a very tectonically active area, so they probably have earthquakes every few months. Um, so there's a little bit of jiggling here. It was estimated that it would take hundreds of thousands of hours of jiggling in order to create these girdled patterns. But there was another question that I, that I, that I want to, uh, so hundreds of thousands of hours, and they wouldn't have been continuous, right? We don't think that earthquakes have been absolutely continuous during time. But you still ask the question, well, how long then? How long have these rocks been sitting here? they found there was a very clever thing that they did. They used some radiometric dating. So I don't want your eyes to glaze over the radiometric dating stuff. This is a very simple form of radiometric dating that you don't really have to understand a lot about. It's, it's quite simple. Um, it's called cosmogenic radiometric dating. And the idea here is that cosmic rays or high energy rays that are coming down through the, from the sun and from, from outer space are impacting the surface of the rock. And as they do so, they gradually change the chemistry of the rock. Right? They actually convert certain atoms or molecules into other molecules, right? rearrange the molecular pattern of the rock. So that's going to happen on the, on the surface of the rock into several inches down into the rock surface. Now, the bottom of the rock is protected from that by the top of the rock. And so it shouldn't experience as much, and the sides of the rock as well. So you could ask this question, how long has the rock been upright? Or has it turned over? Has it turned on its side and then turned a different direction? So you can take samples of the rock from different faces, do this cosmogenic dating, which all it is is looking at the amount of change that's occurred to the elemental breakup. The rocks basically are made of all the same material. And so as you see how much change has occurred, that amount of change is correlated to a certain amount of time because it happens at a fairly consistent rate. Um, and what they found out was these rocks have been sitting here for 500,000 years or more uh, the, the way they are. They haven't tipped over in 500,000 years. Right? Sitting out here for hundreds of thousands of years they've been laying here. Now, as you go up the hill, the source rock is up here. Right? These rocks made from the same stuff as, as the rock at the top of the hill here. If you go up to those rocks and you look at the rocks that have just fallen out, 
all right? And so in other words, they're newly exposed surfaces. You know, their ages are very, very young, hundreds of years, tens of years, maybe thousands of years. And as you were to move down the side of the mountain, what you'd find is more and 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 more, and more, and more disruption of the molecular structure of that rock. So you have a gradated pattern. Now, how does this relate to some of the things that we've heard in this class, right? Snelling has repeated over and over again and talked about radiometric dating, talked about increased the decay rate uh, changing over time. In order for these rocks not to be hundreds of thousands of years old, you'd have to assume that cosmogenic forces or the, or the cosmogenic um, radiation would have to been much, much higher in the past, right? Much higher in the past after the flood. Again, all this, these rocks had to have developed hundreds of years after the flood. Right? So this isn't changing the decay rate during the flood. This is post-flood. You had to have much higher rates of, of, of radiation after the flood. And then because you have a gradation pattern all the way up the, the, the site here, um, you would have to have, at the same time, you would have to have the, the earthquakes being correlated to that. You would have to have... Um, um, I've gotten off track here now. Can't remember what my main point was, but um, well, I know what my main point is. My main point is is that again, it's not reasonable to assume that cosmogenic uh, dating is that far off that it would say hundreds of thousands of years and not just a couple thousand years. When there are other rocks that you could probably date here that might only be a thousand years. So again, this is the eyeball test. All right. If you showed this to uh, a panel of 12 jurors and you gave them, brought them the evidence, you said, what, what seems most likely here? It seems very likely these rocks are very old, right? Beyond reasonable doubt that they're old. So you could say, well, you know, you could make all kinds of stories up about the radiometric dating and how maybe that is skewed by ch changes over the past, but the dating makes perfect sense based on our eyeball test of how long we think they've probably been lying there. It makes sense in terms of this girdling pattern and the amount of, of, of earthquakes that would have to occur to make that pattern. A lot of them over a long period of time, much longer than 4,000 years. So we wouldn't have any reason to doubt the cosmogenic dating because all the other things that we can learn about this particular site suggest that these rocks are old before you even did the radiometric dating. So one last example. We're going to do one last geology thing before we move on to the fossils. All right, this is an image uh, off the coastline of, oh boy, I can't remember now. can't remember where I got this picture from. Uh, but anyway, what it is is a, um, an unconformity. So you saw several unconformities in class. Uh, both um, Ken showed them and Andrew showed them, well, and, and even uh, Terry showed some unconformities, Terry Mortensen. The, what I found interesting was that both Terry and um, Andrew showed unconformities, but they didn't actually talk about the interpretation within flood geology. They raised questions about an ancient Earth interpretation, but they didn't actually present how you would interpret these uh, from a young earth scenario. So here you have, on the bottom of this, you have slanted rocks, which again, as I pointed out, because they're not bent, um, uh, Andrew Snelling's uh, ideas of bending rock when it was soft suggests that these were hard rocks when they were tipped up. And then they had to be eroded off. Well, if they're going to be eroded off and they were already rock, right, that's going to take some time for that erosion. And then you had multiple layers laid on top of that. So this represents um, a history of events that had to occur in a certain order, and it would have taken some time. Now, we can talk all day long about exactly how long it would take for each of these layers to be laid down and so forth, but I, I don't really want to get into that too much. But I want to show you another example of an unconformity and maybe trace through the steps of, of what happened, and we'll see if it, it seems reasonable or not. Um, given our, our different scenarios of the age of the Earth. So let's look at this. It, this one's not nearly as exciting looking, but um, I want to look. I, I, it has some features here that really, I think, will help me make my point. So here we have this lighter colored rock on the bottom. And what you can't see very well, and I'm going to show you in a moment, is that the, it is also vertically striated. All right? So there's many, many thousands of layers, thin layers of rock there that are at an angle. 
and then you see a contact with this uh, darker layer of rock and there are thousands and thousands of thin little sheets of of rock um, on top of that so oh yeah I had it much sooner than I thought so there's the angles I've drawn it for you so you can see like there's the angles of the rocks there so this is this is a classic unconformity looks like the, the, the lower layers of rock were laid first, they were worn off somehow, and then you had an upper layer of, of rock uh, set on top of that. And then the whole thing had to erode so that we could see it. So let me show you a little bit closer up the bottom layer. So this is, this is showing you the lower layers of rock, and it's showing you thousands and thousands and thousands of thin, thin, very thin layers of what appears to be very, very fine sandstone, or maybe silt or clayish material. Uh, probably laid down in water. And then in that, in all of this material, it's cracked, right? So there's very large cracks um, producing these veins. And so the idea here is, and when you see this in geology, again, these are inferences based on what we see in the present and how we know chemistry works. When the rock got shattered or cracked by some kind of upheaval or change in pressure, uh, the rock cracked and the cracks then filled with water, but that water had dissolved minerals in it, those minerals then precipitated out and formed crystals. And so I'm showing you the, all these different cracks here, and the white, there's sort of a white crystal in here, and there's also a darker black crystal, suggesting there might have been two phases to this. Maybe it dried out, and then there was another layer, of, another set of water came in, filled up these cracks again, or maybe it cracked even more, and more water got into these um, cracks and then produced these precipitates. So we end up with these amazing veins running throughout this particular rock. Now let's go to the upper layer of rock. So that's what's found in the lower layers of rock in the unconformity. Let's look at the upper layers of rock. So here's the upper layers of rock showing there's many, many, many sheets of thin, thin, thin layers of, of rock or, or sediment. There's these little tiny um, concretions that are in there as well. They may also be the result of water soaking in there and then minerals starting to form and form these little small balls or hard concretions um, in that rock. So going back to our overall picture of the unconformity, let's look at the history. So I would suggest, and here's what I would propose has happened here in terms of a series of events. Right? First of all, these thousands of layers of thin, whiter layered material had to be laid down. Right? Then all of that had to crack. Now I don't know which happened first, cracking or the tipping up, because they're all vertical as well. I mean they're all tipped vertically. Um, so they're not horizontal anymore, but we think that the layers probably were laid down horizontal. That's just a basic principle of geology that again we kind of all accept even though no one was there to see it. So we accept many parts of historical science as being very accurate and very trustworthy. So here's where the, the different uh, layers, uh, the different veins are. So that would have been step number two. It all cracked and then it formed these veins. But you notice that the veins don't go up into the upper layer. So this whole thing had to, um, oh yeah, then it got tipped up possibly, that's part three. And then part four is after this whole layer of section of rock got lifted up, then it had to be worn off. So, all right, so there had to be some erosive process that eroded this whole thing off, you know, veins and layers all together, leaving a semi-flattish sort of top. You know, it's not completely flat, it's kind of undulating, so I think it was like a little hill. And then after that you had thousands of these little thin layers of interbedded material that look probably like some kind of like a sand dune. That's kind of, they're not all perfectly uh, horizontal, right, or parallel to each other. So probably this is some kind of like sand dune that's on top of that. And then after he had the sand dune placed on top of that, and maybe there was more rock on top of that even that we can't see, so I don't know about that, but it's possible. Uh, all of that had to then turn to rock um, before it was eroded, and then eventually you eroded this hillside off to expose what we now see as this unconformity. All right, so this suggests a whole series of different events. Now, how would flood geologists explain this? I, honestly, I, this is a case where I really am not sure. Uh, I guess they would say there were many flood layers, and then there was, you know, the flood pulled back, and then maybe there was tectonic forces that kind of pushed some land up, and as it got pushed up, it, that kind of fractured and cracked it a little bit, although why it fractured when it should have been soft material, I'm not sure. But 
let's say it had already hardened a little bit, and so when it got pushed up, it also got cracked, and then it got worn off, and then you had water seeping in through here, producing these veins, which then precipitated materials. But precipitation also takes time. Precipitation just doesn't happen overnight. It, take, it might take hundreds of years or thousands of years, we think, but let's just for sake of you know, offering up a possibility that maybe it only occurs in a few days. Um, and then it all gets worn off, and then what you have is these sand dunes put on top. But of course, the sand dunes in a flood geology scenario would have to have been underneath the water. Um, and so maybe water brings in a huge amount of sand, lays it down, these underwater sand dunes. Then all that has to be compacted in a rock, and then it has to be eroded away. Right? So maybe the scenario there is that it does get compacted, and somehow it's, it's hard enough that when the water pulls away that it doesn't just erode the whole thing off, but somehow makes this uh, sheer face. That, well, it's not quite a sheer face, um, but it, this, this cliff face that we're looking at. All, right, all of that's fine, and you might think, well, that's kind of like, like you almost made that sound plausible. And I would say, well, okay, it's, it's possible. It's not very likely. Um, I would say that these events probably take hundreds of thousands of years. Each individual part of this might be thousands of years, or maybe some of it would have been very quickly. The sand dunes could have been a matter of weeks or months. But producing rock, cracks, veins, erosion of rock, and all that, long periods of time. Certainly more than 4,000 years. But I haven't told you one really important thing about this particular picture. It's something you really do have to know in order to interpret this particular picture. All right, I painted a flood geology scenario, but let me pull back. So this is a little bit farther away. We're, we're looking at the same unconformity from a, a farther distance. And what we have here, here's your light colored rock, there's your dark colored rock. And you'll see now in the back distance, you'll see there's a kind of a mountain back there and there's lots of uh, uh, texture to that. There's actually hundreds of, of large layers of rock on, on that mountain too. And it's kind of this reddish rock. In the foreground, you can see a, a variety of different kinds of boulders and they also have layered rocks as well. Now let me pull just a slight bit farther back and show you that here's what took that picture. You got that? Right. Who's taking the picture? This instrument right here. Now, does anyone know who the, what this is? This is the Mars Curiosity rover. Right. This picture was from Mars. What I've been talking about is geology on Mars. What we have been talking about for the last 10 minutes is things that are happening or have happened on Mars. We're looking at the history of Mars. We're doing historical science of Mars. And it's being done by this instrument. You may not be able to see it very well, but there's two little holes in the rock right out in front of it. That's, it has just recently drilled holes in that rock. It's taking drills, is drilling down, pulling out rock, and then putting it in instruments here, burning it, doing all kinds of uh, chemical tests to figure out what the chemistry of is it. And so it's been actually doing the chemistry of this hill to tell us, you know, was that underwater? Was that a sand dune? Uh, and we can determine all those things using present day understanding of geological processes. But in this case, processes occur here on Earth and we're inferring back to, back to Mars. Now, you might say, well, that's a huge inference. But is it that unreasonable? Clearly there are layers of rock. Lots of layers of rock. So if you look farther off in the distance, so with its uh, um, zoom lens, it can take pictures of the mountain in the distance. These are actually just the hills of the mountain. And you see here's 1,500 feet of layered rock. And behind that is almost like rock that looks like sandstone from, from uh, Moab. And then behind that is a higher mountain yet that has obvious layers of rock as well. Sandstones, clay stones, uh, maybe volcanic ash uh, mixed in there as well. This is seen as very much reminiscent of places on Earth. Incredible amounts of geology on Mars. Stepping back further, all you've actually seen is the, um, for those of you who can't see me pointing at this, the landing ellipse where it says landing ellipse where the rover landed. It landed in this giant crater Right, which is 96 miles wide. And inside this crater, there's an 18,000 foot mountain. And the pictures in the previous page, all right, that picture there, is actually just the foothills above where it says landing eclipse. That's just where that is. Okay, you're not even seeing the main mountain at all. all right, that main mountain looks like it's composed of a lot of sedimentary rock. So what we're seeing is on Mars, Mars appears to have a huge history of sedimentary rock. Sedimentary rock formed either by wind blowing sand 
or by water forces. Either way, it represents layers of history, layers of time. All right, now, did all these occur in a global flood? See, we're talking about a global flood on Earth. We're working, you know, creation scientists are trying to convince you that all the geological features on Earth, at least most of them, had to have been formed by massive floods, right, that occurred over a very short period of time. Now, some creation scientists actually suggest there was a flood on Mars at the same time there was on Earth. I don't see the, the theological reason why that's necessary. I think that's a completely ad hoc um, solution to the problem. And it's just as difficult to show that, the, that Mars is young as well. Um, the complexity of the geology there, having unconformities there, suggests changes in Mars history. There were times in which there was erosion. There were times in which there was building up of things. There was times when there was water. There was times when there was blowing sand instead of water at that particular location. It suggests multiple different stages in the history of Mars. So this is on the other side of Mars, right? thousands of miles away. This is the endurance crater showing, again, thousands of layers of rock. Here's another crater that was imaged by the Opportunity rover. And here you can see lots and lots of thin layers of rock. And then there's a thicker layer of sort of white rock there. The top stuff is the debris that was thrown out of the crater um, when the asteroid impacted it. And that debris there is completely worn off. So the surface is flat. It's been windy so long there, and abrasion there has completely worn the rock off into almost complete flat surface. And again, the, 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 the physics of that tells us that that is hundreds of thousands of years. In fact, this particular site, these particular pictures I'm showing you are thought to be hundreds of millions of years old, possibly billions of years old in terms of the way that they look. Um, in other words, you took a snapshot from 100 million years ago, compared it to today, and it'd be kind of like going to a restaurant, you have your kids, and they've got the, like, the pictures where it's sort of like, well, what's different about the two? You'd be hard-pressed to find a difference, even after 100 million years of um, erosion. That might be a little exaggerated, but the, I, I'm trying to impress upon the idea that not much is changing there um, in today's scene. So what have we learned so far? I've been trying to emphasize that there is really no clear distinction. Creation scientists talk about this origin science as if they could put it into a separate category and treat it as if, oh, that's origin science, so you don't have to pay attention to that. You don't have to believe that. You can't because that's all assumptions. That's all inferences. And it's unreliable. And yet, the vast majority of historical science is accepted by everybody. Right? The vast majority of conclusions of historical science and non-experimental science are accepted um, by everyone. It's only the things that seem to impact something that, that we, we care about or think that we don't believe that suddenly get thrown into this pile of, oh, that's origin science. We can test ideas about events from the past. We can have multiple hypotheses about what might have happened. And then we can go out and say, well, what would I expect to see if this had happened versus this, and look for that evidence. That is a form of a test. We come up with tests for what we expect to find and try to find that. Sometimes we don't find that evidence, we find something else. And that points us to a different hypothesis. And we start working down that pathway of then investigating that possible scenario. Common sense interpretation of what we see points to an ancient Earth. It doesn't take a PhD. It doesn't take having to know the ins and outs exactly of how radiometric dating works and being able to figure out all the error bars you can use common sense. Now, our common sense can be wrong. Our senses can be wrong. We are fallen creatures, and we don't see things correctly at times. Even eyewitness reports we know are unreliable. And yet, we do believe that God has given us senses and that they are generally reliable. That when I see the color orange, that it is the color orange. When I see a rock and I observe that it's X number of feet away, that it probably is really X number of feet away. Um, and we take those common sense things that are part of the general revelation and that I think are a um, common grace thing that God has given to everybody. Right? That the non-Christian can stumble upon truths of this world. And part of those truths are the common sense observation that things are old. So next we're going to turn to the fossil record and we're going to look at how 300 years of collecting fossils and describing them has taught us a variety of things about Earth's history. And probably the most important lesson that we'll, we'll learn is that past life was different than the present. What lived in the past is not the same as what we find today. 
So we're and, and we'll look at communities of organisms in the past, and that's where I want to focus my my attention is not just individuals, but how there are complete collections of organisms that we have discovered from the past. So we'll look at part two will be the fossil speak, discovering whole new worlds on Earth. Thank you very much. <laughs>